In the late 90s, early 2000s, there was a huge boom of adult animation. King of the Hill, Family Guy, South Park, Daria, Beavis and Butthead, and that isn't even mentioning all the other forgotten series that fought to the death for their spot on primetime network TV. Yet, of all the shows from this bloody era, one stood above the rest like Mr. Rogers in a bloodstained sweater. A series called The Simpsons. But The Simpsons has already been beaten to death on this hell website, so we're going to talk about Futurama instead. Okay, I jest, but Futurama was in fact a major part of my teenage years growing up. Hearing those opening notes of the theme always brings back memories of late Saturday nights when I would watch reruns of it on Teletoon. And while I'll always hold the early seasons of The Simpsons in extremely high regard as a formative part of my sense of humor, there's something about Futurama that left an impact in its own unique way. And that's partly because there was never a series like it before. Before shows like Rick and Morty in recent years, there was never a cartoon like Futurama that seamlessly blended science, comedy, and emotional storytelling so perfectly that it essentially transcended the medium. Being the brainchild of Simpsons creator and writers, Futurama came out swinging from moment one. And beyond being one of the nerdiest cartoons ever to air, all while contemplating on themes like the nature of God and the humanity of robots, it still was able to keep itself completely rooted as a quirky workplace comedy with an underlying romance. Regardless of all this praise though, Futurama had a lot of troubles when it started airing, partly due to having to live in the cultural shadow of The Simpsons. Like a toddler being looked down on because they haven't done as much as their older brother who finished law school. I can't even judge here because even while starting a video about Futurama, I've already mentioned The Simpsons about three times already and will continue to do it many times more. Despite the strong cult following it eventually did develop though, Futurama continued to have a turbulent history over the years. More than any other animated series in the last few decades, Futurama dealt with an incredibly erratic production, going through multiple series finales, revivals, and cancellations across different networks and even formats, to the point that even the creators never seemed to know what the show's long-term fate would be. So while The Simpsons was able to maintain over the last 30 years, more than a decade after a large majority of fans tuned out, Futurama had to constantly fight tooth and nail just to stay on air until it eventually lost out. And that of course leaves us the question of why? Obviously the easiest answer would be studio execs are incompetent and just leave it at that, but let's dig a little bit further than that. Instead, let's go over why Futurama was so important to begin with, what made it stand out, and most importantly, where things went wrong over the years. So it isn't a stretch to say that The Simpsons was the defining show of the 1990s. It was a cultural icon that latched itself into the psyches of many like a comedy leech that never let go. Find anyone who actively watched TV around that time, and even if they aren't a fan, I'm certain they'll be able to parrot Simpsons quotes at you as long as you'll let them. Boo urns, dental plans, Super Nintendo Chalmers, steamed hams. The series was so massive and far reaching that you couldn't get away from its influence, leading to a new era of primetime animation. And 20th Century Fox, the studio that produced The Simpsons, was starved for another mega hit like it, which they were quick to let the show's creator, Matt Groening, know about. This resulted in multiple attempts to get spin offs based on minor Simpsons characters off the ground, like a live action Krusty the Clown series where he moved to LA to host a talk show. But thankfully, most of these ideas never got further than the planning stage. Fortunately, though, Groening did have something else in mind. For a good few years, Groening had been mulling over an idea for a sci-fi series while he produced The Simpsons, something influenced by the classic science fiction literature he grew up with, by authors like Cordwainer Smith, Theodore Sturgeon, Fred Pohl, and other names that might mean something if sci-fi for you doesn't start and end with lightsabers. But since he had to work on The Simpsons as well as his weekly comic strip Life in Hell, Groening couldn't develop the show by himself. In looking for a co-producer, Groening reached out to David X. Cohen, the sci-fi nerd in the Simpsons writing room, the one who watched Star Trek on repeat and had a BS in computer science from UC Berkeley and a BA in physics from Harvard. 
And when you're the nerdy one of the Simpsons writers, that's saying a lot. Uh, a dog? Uh, isn't that a tad predictable? In your dreams, we're talking the original dog from hell. You mean Cerberus? Cohen was the perfect companion for Groening in getting this series off the ground since he filled the knowledge gaps that Groening had, namely in the science part of science fiction. So from there, the two spend the next solid year developing ideas for this new series in the background, eventually landing on the title Futurama while planning out characters and storylines for the show to develop as they figured out how to pitch it to the higher-ups at Fox. The centerpiece of this sci-fi sitcom would be an out-of-luck slacker pizza delivery boy from the modern day cryogenically frozen for a thousand years as the main character, and exploring the future 31st century he wakes up in. Admittedly, the fish-out-of-water trope isn't exactly breaking new literary ground, but placing a character from the 20th century in an unfamiliar, far-off future made for a perfect point of reference for the audience in learning how this new setting worked, where everything could be built off of his, slash, our perspective, and everything was then built off that foundation. According to Groening, this was the most thought-out pilot ever pitched. Which brings us to April 1998, when Groening and Cohen went to the execs at Fox Studios to pitch the show going into a long-winded two-hour explanation of Futurama's characters, universe, and how they plan to explore them both. Now for some, going this deep into your world building might sound like a great thing for creative, since it proves how much thought went into the idea, but you have to keep in mind that the average pitch for a TV show at a major network is typically 15 minutes, maxing out at 30 if you're extremely lucky. And it should be as condensed as possible since executives have the attention span of toddlers if they don't immediately see dollar signs and merchandising potential. Take Greg Weissman's TV pitch for Gargoyles as an example. It's a tight four minutes that gives a comprehensive overview of everything that would define the series. So while it might seem impressive that Groening and Cohen did a feature length pitch for Futurama, I'd say that level of detail speaks less to their thoroughness and a lot more to how willing the execs at Fox were to hear them out for that long. Do you think more than five minutes was given to the pitch of Married by America or Littlest Groom? No, the reason why Futurama was given that amount of time was because it had Matt Groening attached, and Fox was salivating at the idea of having another Simpsons-esque cash cow they could milk on their network. So they jumped on Futurama as soon as it was pitched to them, ordering a 13-episode season to start off. However, like a fine arts major graduate realizing their job prospects, Fox got buyer's remorse about the show almost immediately after purchasing it. What they wanted was The Simpsons in Space, something very easy to market to the average American family. The Jetsons to The Simpsons Flintstones. But what they were getting was cruder and darker than what they originally thought they were signing up for. You are now dead. Thank you for using Stop and Drop. America's favorite suicide booth since 2008. It didn't help that Groening and Cohen fought back against every change Fox execs attempted to push for. The main reason being that they felt the requests they were being given were contradictory and unhelpful, such as the characters being too mean. Groening had gotten quite used to having all the creative freedom he was being given with The Simpsons, as that deal was made when the Fox network was new and desperate to get anything on air. But now that they were more established, Fox wanted more control over Futurama than they did in the past with The Simpsons, something Groening wasn't willing to give them, which would go on to cement the antagonistic relationship between the studio and Futurama that would continue on for years. Even when the writers for Futurama relented and attempted to appease Fox by toning down the show and writing a more down-to-earth episode, with Fry and his friend Bender spending an episode looking for an apartment, the executives still weren't happy with it, strongly implying that they didn't actually know what they wanted other than control of the show. So since there was no way to truly meet in the middle with the studio, the Futurama creators decided to go full on with what they wanted to do, consequences be damned, with Grinning managing the executives as he gave his own notes throughout the production, and Cohen acting as Futurama's head writer and showrunner going forward. And now we get to talking about the actual show of Futurama. And it only took 10 minutes. I'm getting faster. Now, early on when I started working on this script, I set a restriction for myself to avoid even mentioning The Simpsons to see how far I could realistically get. 
But as I've already demonstrated, it's nigh impossible to talk about Futurama historically or artistically without eventually bringing it up, so might as well lean into it. Actually, while it's good to look at a show by its own merits, examining how Futurama deviated from what came before may be the best place to start off from in understanding what it did well. Because while some were hoping for another Simpsons like Fox did, The Simpsons was a tough act to follow. By the early 2000s, even The Simpsons was beginning to struggle with that. So the best way to avoid having to worry about those expectations is to do everything completely different. In fact, while Futurama regularly has to compete with The Simpsons due to their relation to each other and the fact it came after, I would say Futurama actually benefits in some ways by coming second. To start, where The Simpsons took a couple seasons to really hit its stride as the writers were getting a grasp on what they wanted the show to be, like most sitcoms typically do, Futurama came out of the gate knowing exactly what it was, starting off with one of the strongest first seasons of any animated sitcom. You want the rest of the champagne? No, and it's pronounced champagne. Oh god, no! Nearly every episode of season one was an instant classic that perfectly established Futurama's world and characters that later seasons would then build on. You have a trip to a moon-based theme park exploring historical revisionism, a pro-environmental message about not putting off problems on later generations through the lens of an Armageddon parody, and an episode that mixes Animal House with Flowers for Algernon. While I wouldn't say Futurama was always gut-bustingly funny like its predecessor, it was always clever. Perfectly mixing low and high culture by blending together classic sci-fi serials with modern pop culture. I could just continue listing examples to prove my point, but I think this is highlighted best in one of my personal favorite episodes, Godfellas, where Bender is put in the position of God to a tiny civilization that lands on his body as he floats through space, and is faced with the dilemma of what being God means, and how humans deal with that relationship. A reminder that this is a cartoon where a goofy robot gets liquored up in space, and is then faced with some of the most complex questions humanity continues to struggle with. I mean yes, on the surface, Futurama is still a goofy comedy, but underneath it had legitimate science fiction concepts at work. The trade-off however is that I think this is why Futurama didn't stick as well in the cultural zeitgeist compared to The Simpsons, at least on an immediate level. With The Simpsons, it was instantly recognizable for what it was satirizing, acting as a parody of American suburbia and modern culture in general, something that could be appreciated on a near universal level, where Futurama was doing, I don't know, some nerd sci-fi shit. But that's what made it more attractive to those that loved it. Almost by design, Futurama was never going to be the mainstream hit to the degree The Simpsons was due to its setting and genre. But the core audience that this series would develop would become devoted fans since it was giving them something they hadn't seen before. And what added further to this is how the show handled its characters. Instead of focusing on a family unit like The Simpsons, and a large majority of animated sitcoms since, Futurama's cast is entirely asymmetrical, being designed to be as subversive and contradictory as possible. Leela's a one-eyed space pilot who lacked depth perception, Amy, the Martian of the cast, is a down-to-earth Asian party girl, Hermes is a Jamaican bureaucrat who did competitive limbo, and Dr. Zoidberg's a poor doctor alien lobster meant to treat humans, on top of having a Yiddish accent despite being a giant walking shellfish. That last one's about three layers of comedic contradictions pile over top of each other. That's just impressive. The only familial ties out of the entire cast was Fry and Professor Farnsworth, and on top of the joke being that the uncle of the two is only in their 20s, even that's extremely downplayed and acts almost solely as a way to get Fry's job as a delivery boy at Planet Express. Where most primetime animation and sitcoms at the time were more often aimed at families, Futurama was built around found family over biological, which is why I believe the series did so well with young adults comparatively. It didn't have that broad reaching appeal, as it was more for the misfit adolescents during the turn of the millennia that likely felt out of place too. The disconnected millennial youth that were looking toward the future rather than the Barts and Homers of the world. But by far, the most distinct character of the crew, and the one that drew the most attention, was the amoral, self-serving, narcissistic, kleptomaniac, alcoholic robot Bender. Precocious little scamp, ain't I? Of all the cast, Bender Bending Rodriguez was easily the breakout star of the show, as a crass, substance-abusing robot was something never seen before in sci-fi or cartoons. 
In the same way, there was never really a father figure in a family sitcom like Homer before. Frankly, I have a feeling it's going to be hard to even edit this video, since most background clips are going to be heavily dominated by Bender scenes, as he has a lion's share of the best moments. Something the writers seemed to do intentionally, as he progressively took up more screen time as the series continued after they realized how popular he was. In giving him all that screen time though, Bender is ironically made out to be the most human character of the cast. Contrary to Asimov's laws of robotics rooted in nearly all science fiction, or possibly in spite of them, Bender always aims to serve his best interests first and foremost, often breaking those laws to do so. From early on in the series, Bender was defined as a character completely driven by their emotions. Regardless of not having a sense of taste, he has the irrational dream of being a chef while watching cooking shows, he falls in love multiple times, he's even hurt when Fry decided he would live in an apartment without him. When Fry first meets him, Bender's standing in line for a suicide booth because he couldn't deal with the fact that girders he bent for a living were in fact made for suicide booths. Still doesn't stop him from trying to skip out on the toll. With how he's treated, a frequent idea that comes up with Bender throughout the series is what the idea of humanity means in the context of sentient robots. If they all have the same emotions and philosophical concerns that humans do, what makes them any less… huh. Alright Taro, I'll give you a pass on this one. We'll call it horny inspiration and move on till I get to that Automata video. In this retro-futuristic future of New New York, where famous figures are kept alive posthumously as heads floating in jars, there was a lot of creative freedom in what both the writing and animation team could get away with, from the architecture of the buildings to the ludicrousy of some of the professor's inventions. As Cohen originally wrote out when planning the series, reality should not stand in the way of comedy. However, the ability to be absurd and reject reality for a good gag didn't mean there wasn't a scientific basis to the writing. As a matter of fact, there's a lot more scientific backing to Futurama than most would likely notice on first viewing without a fluency in binary or a mathematics undergrad. The writers room for Futurama collectively held 50 years of education at Harvard alone, including master's degrees in math, computer science, and philosophy, with PhDs in chemistry and applied mathematics, which they then used to make jokes about the logistics of having two giant balls of garbage in space smash into each other. So they got more use out of their degrees than your average college graduate. But because the writer's room was full of trained scientists writing a science fiction series, something that was incredibly uncommon at the time, there was a clear conscientious effort to getting the math right on display whenever possible, resulting in hour-long conversations about how the Madison Cube Garden would be designed for bleachers. For example, in the season 1 episode Fish Full of Dollars, the entire setup is that Fry's old bank account of 93 cents has accumulated to 4.3 billion dollars after a thousand years of interest. Now, as a kid, I simply shrugged off that detail as numbers get bigger. But if you actually do the math and adding in the annual and compound interest over time, it perfectly checks out. Though if you also account for inflation over the years, that money would be nearly worthless. But that's beside the point. Not many would even notice that detail, but the fact the writers were putting in the time to check their maths demonstrates the effort that was being put in. And that kind of nerdy meticulousness was all over the show. That's why few series appealed to that comic book guy type in the same way Futurama did. Years before nerd culture was the new cool, Futurama was already making jokes about Star Trek fans, mathematical algorithms, and programming languages. And since Futurama started during the era of the VHS recordings, and eventually DVR, the writers stuffed the show with freeze frame moments for the mega fans that would comb through every scene to pick up on them. So much thought went into the simplest background details that two different alien languages were made solely as world building details in the backdrop for fans to decode. One that was a basic substitution cipher for the Latin alphabet that was cracked fairly quickly, and the other was a more complex auto key cipher that involves a bit of math to figure out. While not exactly Klingon, it was a good amount of effort to put in for gags that only a select few would catch, but by intention, that was how Futurama worked. The operating principle in the writer's room for Futurama was that you could do a joke that 1% of the audience got, as long as it didn't completely derail the enjoyment of everyone else. And because of that extra little attention to detail, that 1% would become fans for life. That's why the smartest jokes of the show just flew by most unnoticed, because they weren't the central focus in most cases, and were just there for those quick enough to catch it. So no one felt dumber for not understanding what a Klein bottle is for the half second it was on screen. 
since it also happens in a series where a robot shits bricks. And who can't enjoy that? The funny thing is though, despite this being a hyper nerdy sci-fi sitcom set a millennium into the future, the world detailed in Futurama couldn't be more dull and mundane. Even after scientists have perfected commercial interplanetary space travel and fully sentient robots, with multiple alien species having made contact, Earth is still rife with plenty of the same tedious problems people were dealing with at the turn of the last millennium. And that's ultimately the point it's driving at. Culturally in the past, there was always huge expectations for how we'd progress in the future, especially as technology grew faster and faster, regardless of there being no concrete evidence that that's how things would go. Like, look at what 1950 expected fashion in the year 2000 to be. A dress of aluminium with a sash to change it for afternoon or evening, and an electric headlight to help her to find an honest man. But the reality is that the future is always going to be way more banal than we expect it to be. In his video, Is Futurama the Best Argument Against Transhumanism, Mike Rugnetta of PBS Idea Channel brings up the theory of the hedonic treadmill. Put in simple terms, the hedonic treadmill is the observed tendency of humans to quickly return to a relative stable level of happiness despite major positive or negative events or life changes. Basically, no matter what technological leaps are made, even ones that vastly improve our quality of life, humans always end up defaulting to a baseline of, eh, things are okay I guess. This of course implies that while we will always find ways to improve, we're never going to reach a transcendental level of happiness through our progress which is perfectly captured in the way Futurama presents its setting. Not quite the utopian what a bright future it will be that Star Trek envisioned, nor the dystopian everything's fucked and technology's only gonna make it worse like your 1984 and Akira's, Futurama sits somewhere in the middle with a beleaguered, eh, what if everything stays largely the same but with better tech, which is definitely a deviation from most science fiction prior to the 2000s. In Matt Groening's words, Science fiction, for the most part, operates on a new age military motif. If we can just follow orders from our benevolent captain, then we can defeat the outside evil and everything will be great, right? But that's under the massive assumption that those in power are actually concerned for the people. With The Simpsons, the message is continually about how America's moral authorities don't always have your best interests in mind. Teachers, principals, clergymen, politicians, they're all just goofballs which is where a lot of the comedy of the show comes from. Help! Help! Police! Hey, I got problems of my own right now. Oh boy, this is gonna get worse before it gets better. With Futurama, it was doing something similar, but with a much grander scale, showing how large systems fail and will continue to fail in the future. Major corporations and governments are a mix of incompetent and malicious. There's still socioeconomic class issues, though it's represented with mutants and robots. Problems like global warming and conservation are hand-waved away until they hit crisis level, at which point they're handled with the utmost grace and care. You know guys, I don't want to alarm anyone, but I think Futurama might be political. And in my amusing little way, I try to hit some of the unspoken rules of our culture. By setting the show in the future, maybe we can get away with pretending the comments on the injustices and contradictions of our times are just the fantasy elements of a place far away. Just like the hedonic treadmill can apply to how humans regard technological advancement, Futurama goes to show it also works in relation to societal shifts as well. The future of the 31st century is as corporate, commercial, and militaristic as the 21st, but amplified through scientific advancement. Yet everyone takes it all in stride like it's no big deal. The people of Earth are implanted with chips to appoint them their permanent career assignment, and senior citizens are taken to be stored in a giant mechanical planet once they hit a certain age. Both things that are simply treated as a fact of life. Capitalist society has even gone so far that commercials are literally beamed into people's dreams, and it's simply shrugged off as completely normal. Even Fry, who actively argues against it as going too far, ends up accepting it in the end after everyone tells him he's overreacting and goes to buy the product he was being sold on. I mean, could you imagine having an ad shoved in your face at any time like that? Corporations just coming into your personal space during your most vulnerable moments? Personally, I prefer my ads surreptitiously shoved in the middle of YouTube video essays. Do you need a new wallet? Well, I think it's time you learned a lesson about Lightspeed brand briefs. I mean, extra smart wallets. Extra's wallets come in a variety of colors and styles made to fit comfy in your pocket, which you can get in either tanned premium leather or their new vegan leather created from recycled windshields and is indistinguishable from the real deal. 
The built-in trigger design allows for slick and easy card access at the click of a button, along with RFID protection to keep your card safe when not in use. And never misplace your wallet again with the Solar Power Tracker, which connects right to your phone and other home devices for ease of use. So use the code FOXCATE5 at checkout for an extra 5% discount on top of any other site promotions, including the Black Friday sales currently running until November 29th. Just follow the link in the description below. Extra wallets, style and comfort for the discerning pockets. Oh, what a weird dream. I'll never get back to sleep. Ultimately though, you didn't have to be a big brain science fan or a philosopher in metaphysics to appreciate what Futurama was doing. In actuality, some of the peak moments that stood out the most were the ones that were built on emotion over intelligence. And that's because the truest strength of Futurama's writing is that underneath these classical science fiction stories was a core of sincere character work elevating everything around it. A fundamental credo of the series established by Groening was that you could put the characters in any sort of crazy, bizarre situation that can be dreamt up, but they had to react in a way which people could sympathize with even if we're talking about alcoholic robots and homeless lobsters. So as the series moved forward, there grew to be a coordinated blend of sentimental character stories with the heavy sci-fi themes and settings, which developed into some genuinely fantastic episodes like A Pharaoh to Remember, a story about Bender attempting to leave a lasting legacy so that it'll never be forgotten, or Leela's Homeworld, where Leela finally finds her long-lost parents, who aren't in fact the aliens she thought they were, but actually mutants the second-class citizens of Earth who are forced to live in the sewers. Stripping away the concept of aliens and mutants, the idea of parents giving up their child so that they could have a better chance at life, even if it means they can't be a part of it, is a relatable, emotionally powerful, and ironically human story, which reinforces Leela's character for the rest of Season 4 as she tries to reconnect with the family she never knew. When looking at how the main characters were handled, a central theme for Futurama was about how one finds their place in the universe, perfectly fitting with its core age demographic of young adults, who themselves likely experience similar feelings. Fry's out of his time, having lost all his loved ones in the past, and is learning where he fits in this era. Leela spends the better part of the first three seasons looking for where she came from, and Bender has an identity crisis every few episodes as a fully sentient robot in a society where they're still treated as tools. It's often played off as a joke or a way to frame an episode, but there was a clear heart to many of the characters and their stories as they progressed through the series, adding a lot to the emotional core keeping the show together. Easily the most recognized moment for Futurama's ability to tug at the heartstrings, though, is the now iconic episode Jurassic Bark where Fry finds the thousand-year-old remains of his old dog Seymour Asses. But when presented with the chance to revive him, Fry chooses not to after learning he passed away at the age of 15, believing his faithful pet had moved on and lived a full life without him. Despite that not entirely being the case, I'm okay. <sighs> Truly, I don't think you can even mention the ending of Jurassic Bark to most millennials who grew up on Futurama without potentially causing them to spring a leak. While the show was intended to be an episodic affair, it also spent a lot of time rewarding longtime viewers for paying attention, typically by taking offhanded references and jokes and paying them off in later seasons. But this also manifested in ongoing story arcs that progressed through the series, with Leela and Fry's developing relationship being at the center of it. As the emotional linchpin of the show, this college dropout from the stupid ages and a cyclops mutant were set up as a pair from the very first episode. Though at first it may have started as just two people who bonded over the fact they felt like outcasts in this world and didn't know where they really belonged, it began to develop as the series progressed. What starts as a simple crush on his new captain eventually leads to Fry developing stronger and stronger feelings for Leela, but his man-child immaturity continues to put Leela off. As a result, the relationship's progression is the conflict between Fry attempting to prove himself through grand romantic gestures as Leela gradually starts to warm up to him in spite of his many flaws. Over the course of the show, you see the two go from platonic friends to co-workers with some romantic tension, all the way to a proper couple that have finally connected. But much like the series itself, we'll come back to all that later. Alright, at this point, before we get to the studio interference we all know is coming, I do first want to briefly talk about Futurama's animation. At initial glance, Futurama clearly looks like any mech grinning work, with all the signature features of his art style. Overbites, weak chins, four-fingered hands. 
Due to their simple yet strong designs though, each character still had a very distinct silhouette and is visually memorable by emphasizing their unique traits. This is how we got characters like Hedonism Bot or the Hyper Chicken. Since Futurama was set in a science fiction setting with aliens and robots throughout, the animation team could go wilder with the show's designs and backdrops than any of its contemporaries could since there was much less concerns about any sort of modern day realism, which really helped to set it apart from everything else at the time. So while it's not exactly mind blowing in the year 2020, Futurama stood head and shoulders above pretty much every other animated series of its time when it came to its look. And what really put it over the top was its use of 3D animation, which is the main reason I wanted to bring this all up. Now of course I know talking about 3D animation being added into 2D has the potential to get you spit in the eye in certain circles, but the thing is, Rough Draft Studios, the production company who did the animation for Futurama, were one of the first to really pull it off this well and consistently, which they did by avoiding it looking like 3D. When Groening and Cohen were looking for a studio to animate Futurama, Rough Draft actually won the bid for the job by creating a brief demo that seamlessly mixed hand-drawn cell animation with 3D, which isn't as simple as I'm making it sound. Both 2D and 3D art styles have their strengths and weaknesses in animation, but when trying to blend the two together, it can often be visually jarring if not handled well because you're attempting to add a rendered CG model into a flat image insert reference to Flatland here. I mean, look at Anastasia, a movie that came out two years before Futurama, attempting to integrate this simple 3D music box into a fully 2D world. I'm certain this was done to make it easy to animate the figurines inside spinning around, but when you see it in scenes where characters are physically handling it, it just unnaturally hovers around like that one creepy guy at the bar standing by the bathrooms. So in order to avoid this disconnect between the 2D and 3D, what the animators at Rough Draft did with Futurama was what they termed dumbing down the models. According to the director of computer graphics, Scott Vanzo, during the late 90s, commercially available 3D packages were generally tuned to help produce uber lifelike appearances. So the studio had to carefully control the lighting, modeling the three props and characters with imperfections to enhance their cartoony feel, and lastly, by rendering the 3D with a non-photorealistic process that makes the lines and shadings look like it's hand-drawn and cell-painted. What they were essentially doing was making 3D models look as close to 2D animation as possible, but still have the benefits of working with CG which was incredibly useful for animating objects like spaceships, robots, buildings, and explosions. Things that would have been way too expensive to do in 2D. And yeah, that's the other side of it too. The use of 3D by Rough Draft wasn't done solely for artistic reasons, but also budgetary ones. Attempting to animate space travel and holograms would have been too costly to animate traditionally, so 3D modeling was incorporated to make the futuristic elements of the setting work with everything else. Being developed during the industry transition from traditional hand animation to digital, Futurama was actually drawn at first on paper, then scanned to be colored digitally, which made it significantly easier to add CG models into the mix since the animators could easily tinker with color, composition, and lighting. Obviously you can still tell when you're looking at a 3D model compared to a 2D drawing if you look for it, but the cell shading and line work being done so that it matched with the hand drawn animation made it blend so that it doesn't feel out of place or become a distraction to the eye. Granted, the 3D could still look slightly, to use a technical term here, wonky in the occasional scene, especially when objects suddenly gained an extra dimension between shots. But using CG models actually did allow for much more freedom with the animation, as shots could be much more dynamic without having to hand draw every frame of every angle. So rather than CG being used to replace traditional cell animation at the cost of a consistent art style, it was actually used as a tool to work alongside it and often enhance it, being one of the first major attempts at blending 2D and 3D in modern animation without compromising either. And that feels like something that's largely gone unrecognized as the years have gone on.
Alright, now obviously after talking for so long about how unique and trailblazing Futurama was, we of course finally arrive at the point in the video where we go into how it was mismanaged to death. You see, when the show was originally in early production, Greening really wanted Futurama to air on Sundays after The Simpsons and before The X-Files. Which made perfect sense. Not only would it allow the show to find an audience that would be most primed to enjoy it, but Futurama's placement would have made for an amazing segue from a cartoon sitcom to a sci-fi mystery drama. And Graining wasn't wrong in thinking that, as Futurama's first episode in that time slot premiered at 19 million viewers, one of the top most viewed pilots Fox had ever seen at the time, along with a strong response from critics. So following that, naturally the Fox execs saw this, realized they had another potential billion dollar franchise on their hands, and left the creators to their business? Of course not, or I wouldn't be bringing any of this up. No, instead Fox took Futurama, gave it next to zero promotion, tossed around the schedule like accusations at a Smash tournament, and proceeded to be shocked when it didn't perform well. Swear there's no relation. To give the execs more credit than they likely deserve, the original plan Fox had was that, after previewing Futurama in that slot on Sunday for its first two episodes as a way to advertise the show, it would then be moved over to Tuesday nights to be part of a block of animated series like King of the Hill and the PJs, with Family Guy taking the coveted spot following The Simpsons. And while rearranging schedules to optimize the week's programming and showcasing new series isn't unheard of, this wouldn't be a one-off change. When Futurama finally did land back on early Sunday evenings again the next season, it would regularly get pushed back for sports broadcasts that went on too long causing continued problems with its ratings. Then as the years went on, the show continued to be batted around varying time slots with little rhyme or reason, even in the middle of seasons, leading to fans never knowing what time or day to tune in, and a further decline in viewership because of it. Of course, some might say I'm a bit biased against Fox due to my clear preferential feelings towards Futurama and its creators, especially since the executives can't exactly speak for themselves, and that may be true. However, I will say it's not as if this treatment was unique to Futurama either. You remember that little Family Guy series I briefly mentioned earlier? The show Futurama was pushed aside for? Yeah, that went through the same mismanagement before it was cancelled in 2002 at the end of its third season. And considering when it returned in 2005, after the execs saw the amount of money they were getting from its DVD sales and ratings through syndication when it had a proper time slot given, it quickly became a pillar of Fox's animation branding for over a decade. So you can see that maybe the Fox executives in charge at the time didn't exactly know what they were doing with the properties they managed. But whether it was the low ratings, the cost of episodes, Craning's unwillingness to cooperate, or the utter resentment from the higher ups that was the cause of Futurama eventually going off the air in the end, we don't really know for certain because the indifference the execs at Fox had to the series even came across in how the show was cancelled. Since Futurama wasn't technically cancelled, they just weren't asked to make more. To elaborate slightly, when a show gets renewed for a new season, the creators are being told by the top brass that they're renewing their contract, thus giving them the thumbs up that they're going to be getting the funding to produce more episodes. So when a show is given multiple season renewals in advance, that's an endorsement from the top that the creators can plan further in advance without worrying about the possibility that the next season might be the last. With Futurama, however, every season, the staff would get the renewal notice for the upcoming season later and later, giving them less time to deliver a solid show since they couldn't start planning production until they got the go-ahead. After a couple seasons, the writing staff started to just get used to it. But partway into the production of season 4, when they would typically get the notice for the new seasons being purchased, months passed and no notice ever came. No one from Fox arrived to tell them they were cancelled or why. Just silence. Even after getting barraged by fans of the show petitioning to order a fifth season, Fox never gave a clear statement on the show's future right up until the end. Fortunately though, the creators seemed to see the writing on the walls beforehand, so they wrote the final episode of season 4, The Devil's Hands Are Idle Playthings, to be an open-ended series finale, being a bittersweet, operatic send-off to the cast and Fry and Lilo's relationship after the last four years. Please don't stop playing, Fry. 
I want to hear how it ends. In an interview after it was confirmed Futurama wasn't returning for another season, Matt Groening said, The people of Fox didn't ever support the show, and it wasn't to their taste. And, in my opinion, they're out of their minds. But they don't like The Simpsons either. The idea of a TV show they haven't gotten their greasy fingers all over creatively drives them nuts. That's why almost everything else is so lousy. We won the Emmy for the best animated show, and I didn't even get a begrudging phone call from anyone at Fox. That's a dark company that they can't even make a fake phone call. And while it might feel petty, Grinning isn't exactly wrong to feel slighted by this, as that Emmy wasn't an outlier, since Futurama won many over the course of its initial run alongside other TV awards, where most series Fox produced at the time wouldn't even get a nomination. But if dedicated viewership and highly positive reception wasn't going to save Futurama, a few awards on the mantle wasn't going to do much either. And so, the writers and animators of Futurama simply accepted the hand they were dealt, and started looking for other work, either returning to focusing on The Simpsons, or going on to new ventures. Another classic science fiction show cancelled before its time. Now, obviously, if this was Firefly or Freaks and Geeks, that would be the end of it. A show that wasn't really appreciated by the studio number crunchers, yet continued to live on solely by its cult following for decades. And in all honesty, we could have left it at those four seasons. Futurama could have been viewed as this series way ahead of its time that came and went, leaving behind 72 episodes of one of the best animated sitcoms ever, ending on a poignant farewell as Fry and Leela holographically walk off into the sunset together. But like a highly infectious virus in a country without a proper pandemic response, Futurama refused to die. Or it would be better to say its fans refused to let it die. Before I go any further though, keep in mind that screams and petitions aren't likely to get Reaper back on the air. What studios like Fox actually care about if they're going to revive a series is numbers that easily translate into cash money. And similar to Family Guy, it was the popularization of DVDs in the early 2000s that demonstrated the continued financial interest in Futurama. When they started being put out near the end of the series, the four seasons sold incredibly well on DVD by its legions of devoted fans that wanted to be able to watch it at any time since it wasn't easily accessible before. Keep in mind that this was in the nightmare period where everything wasn't online at all times, so you either needed the tapes or wait for episodes to appear in syndication. Like some sort of caveman. Glad things are so much better now. What helped even further was how Futurama did in syndication. When it began airing on Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, and other channels between 2003 and 2005, Futurama saw a lot of success, both in its ratings and overall exposure, since it was no longer restricted to one network, was actively promoted, and actually had a set time slot. Huh. Who knew that constantly being pushed aside for NASCAR and reruns of True Lies might harm a show's ratings? So between the quality DVD sales and solid syndication ratings across other networks, Fox Home Entertainment decided to order a couple of direct-to-DVD Futurama movies to cash in and potentially gauge interest, without having to possibly invest in multiple seasons ahead of time. And after some negotiations and Matt Groening doing a few victory laps around the studio parking lot, the producers agreed to fund four films, but with the stipulation that the movies would be cut up into four equally sized episodes that could be easily tossed into syndication packages, which altogether would create a proper fifth season. And with that, work on season 5 started in 2005, and the first movie, Bender's Big Score, releasing in late 2007. So everything's great now? I mean, yeah, Futurama's back, baby! Right? Well, unfortunately, this is where the analysis part of this video gets a tad more complicated, as this is where we start to get into the more hit-or-miss parts of Futurama, because these movies are also the point where the series starts to show some... cracks. See what I did there? Though to immediately backtrack on what I literally just said, the first couple movies were a pretty solid return for the series, all things considered. Being the first of the four, Bender's big score is probably the strongest right out of the gate. Before I continue however, I know this video is already extensively long, but I'm gonna have to do four rapid fire reviews for these movies here because all of them have different issues that end up highlighting future problems that are gonna be creeping in. Anyway, Bender's Big Score's core premise is that after returning to the air after getting uncancelled by the Box Network, this opening isn't exactly subtle about its commentary, 
Planet Express ends up getting conned by a race of scammer aliens, who end up finding a tattoo of Bender on Fry's ass that includes a code that can allow one-way travel backwards through time, which they then use to plunder Earth of all its historical treasures with a mind-controlled Bender. Meanwhile, Fry is hurt when Leela falls for a man named Lars, who works at the Head Museum, and takes a chance to use the time code to travel back to the year 2000, where he spends the next few years looking after a lonely narwhal. Though, because of time travel complications, this ends up creating two Fry's, one in the present past and one in the future present. Describing the synopsis in simple terms makes it sound like this should be a complete mess of a movie, but it ends up creating a great time travel heist film mixed with a love story that surprisingly works, since both storylines end up layering into each other and build off what the other is doing. Make note of that for later. This also wasn't a basic Disney direct-to-video production either. The animators at Rough Draft Studios, both in their California and Korean branches, work to bring these films to the next level. While the original run of Futurama was formatted to the standard 4x3 of the time, the films were bumped up to 16x9 in order to capture a more cinematic feel by comparison. And in terms of scale, this first movie does everything it can to bring in every fan-favorite character for some screen time, from Robot Santa and Nixon, all the way to Al Gore and Bubblegum Tate. In that way, Bender's big score was a clear celebration of everything that made Futurama special during its initial run, with a little extra flair since they had DVD movie money to spend now. However, this also leads to some failings that are much more noticeable when the excitement of Futurama returning isn't there anymore. Without getting too much into pedantic nitpicking, the major problem is how the time travel subplot of Bender's big score weakens canonical details of the series by establishing that Fry went back to his past life for a few years after escaping the scammer aliens by using the time code, namely in regards to Jurassic Bark, where the reason Seymour is solidified in stone isn't because he passed away from old age waiting for Fry to come back, but because of an explosion caused by Bender shooting a laser to kill his old roommate. <sighs> Look, I know the writers were simply being cheeky, and I can't deny that outside of breaking continuity that the large storyline is touching, but most of the episodes centered around Fry or about the loved ones he left behind when he went to the future and how that affected them. So seeing these powerful moments be completely retconned just doesn't sit right. And these aren't easily shrugged off jokes either since it's rooted in the core premise of the movie. Then following up Bender's big score is The Beast with a Billion Backs which continues off from the cliffhanger of the first movie, where reality is beginning to shatter due to time paradox shenanigans. Confusingly though, despite following up from that ending, it starts with Fry getting into a polygamous relationship with a brand new woman, completely sidestepping the whole point about the Lars storyline in the previous film, something that the movie quite literally points out at the end. You think maybe- Oh please, you forgot me quick enough when you met Colleen. That's true. To its credit, this is clearly a contrivance meant to work with the plot, which focuses on an interdimensional alien that tries to take over and then seduce the entire universe, thematically being about loving relationships never being perfect and inherently require compromise between all parties to be fulfilling. But it unfortunately comes at the cost of punting the emotional core of the last movie to get to that point. Sadly though, this is only the start of how the romance in this series gets kicked around, but we'll get to that later. Beast definitely has its strong moments, and of the four films is the most thematically consistent, but I'd be lying if I didn't admit that the excitement of Futurama returning fueling these movies is starting to wear off at this point, and we're only going downhill from here. Frankly, while the promise of four films likely sounded promising to everyone involved when it was first pitched, I'd argue the law of diminishing returns starts to kick in harder and harder as they progress, specifically with the third and fourth. The best way I could describe these last two is that the core premise of the material had potential, but wasn't enough to carry over an hour and 20 minutes. So there's a lot of meandering as it gets to the point, kind of like this sentence. To start, the third movie, Bender's Game, deviates from even the vague attempt at keeping these movies interconnected like the last two, and is instead a chance for the nerds in the writer's room to wax off about D&D and the Lord of the Rings movies, as this was nearly a decade before Disenchanted was made and they even got a chance to do as such yet. Now, admittedly, doing fantasy tropes through the lens of science fiction could have been an interesting take, but aside from just not making good use of that premise, instead doing a lot of mediocre Tolkien references, there's no real emotional throughline for this movie keeping it together, which is quite noticeable when you compare it to the last two movies. The closest thing is the reveal that Igner, one of Mom's sons, is actually Professor Farnsworth's, 
which is a fun twist considering Farnsworth and Mother's relationship within the series. But it feels like there's zero impact to the reveal with how it's handled, and it isn't addressed ever again outside of the film itself. To the point, you have to question why it was even brought up in the first place. I could forgive a lot of these flaws though if it wasn't for the fact that Bender's game is as needlessly stretched out as production time of this video. Since these movies were mandated to a strict 87-89 minute runtime so that they could be sliced up into four full length episodes each, the pacing of them can be downright awful, as the writers are clearly more used to writing and structuring around 22 minutes comparatively. While this wasn't as much of a problem with Bender's big score and Beast with a Billion Backs, this pacing issue becomes aggressively apparent with Bender's game, where the core appeal of Futurama parodying fantasy tropes doesn't kick in until nearly two thirds of the way through the movie. I'm all good with a slow burn as plot lines and jokes are set up, but this movie drags its heels in order to fill out its runtime, and it isn't filling it with anything interesting or entertaining, like a YouTube video trying to meet an eight minute runtime. There's simply no weight to anything this movie's doing compared to the first two and likely would have been better off condensed into a what-if type episode in the series proper, or even a 60 minute movie since there clearly isn't enough worthwhile content for it to be almost 90. But then on the flip side of Bender's game's failings, there's Into the Wild Green Yonder. Since four movies were all the staff was promised, Into the Wild Green Yonder was written to be another finale for the series, which makes it even odder how that one fits into the rest of the films, as it's the one with easily the weakest stakes and inconsistent storyline going for it. The base premise is that, while on a trip to New Mars Vegas, Fry gets caught up in a group of mind-reading hobos involved in a war between two ancient alien species, as Leela leads an eco-feminist group trying to stop Leo Wong from destroying a large chunk of the Milky Way for a giant mini-golf course. On the face of it, there is some clear parallels going on between the two main storylines that could have led to some fun moments as Leela and Fry's two groups end up clashing. But then you add in Bender romancing the Dombot's wife, then becoming a lackey for Zap Brannigan, a high stakes poker tournament, an extended jailbreak sequence, Fry becoming a security guard for Leo Wong, Amy rejecting her dad for his constant jokes about her weight, and a subplot about Planet Express nearly going out of business. Because we need to bring in Hermes the Professor and Zoidberg in somehow. Where Bender's game didn't have enough going on and feels padded to hell because of it, into the Wild Green Yonder has too much going on and everything feels weaker since nothing's allowed to breathe. Everything I listed could have worked within the narrative and what it was working towards, but it's all crammed into the point where you're just getting bombarded with scenes and characters. Into the Wild Green Yonder was clearly intended to be a huge scale event to celebrate the series in case this would be its last outing, framed as a grand ecological science fiction epic where every character possible was brought in and the relationship between Leela and Fry was finally given some closure in the case that this would be the true finale. But it drags on for over an hour with no clear direction on where it's going and why, shifting from one inconsequential plot point to the next as a series of end then story beats, which ultimately robs that scale of any real value since it doesn't feel like it built up to anything meaningful. And this feels like it undercuts the movie's ending, where the cast fly off into a wormhole with no clear idea on where they'll end up, obviously alluding to the nature of the show's nebulous status at the end of the film's production, as the creators were still waiting to know if these movies would get them picked up for further seasons, or if this would be the end yet again. Honestly, if they were better planned out, allowed to be as long or short as they needed instead of forced to meet a specific runtime, and better use some of their characters, these films could have been a highlight for the series as a triumphant return and a massive middle finger to the Fox Studios on top of it. But frustratingly, we're only getting started with the erratic quality of Futurama from here. So with how well the movies performed sale-wise, the Fox network felt pretty confident about commissioning another proper season of the show, but this time with Comedy Central purchasing the airing rights for these new episodes. In order to make the deal though, costs had to be cut, meaning the number of returning writing staff and producers had to be trimmed, and the time to deliver episodes was cut down, which goes to explain why a lot of the writers from earlier seasons didn't return, and Fox attempting to recast the voice actors due to supposed salary negotiations collapsing, but this ploy lasted only about a month until Fox caved to pay the original cast more than they offered at first. Now, this is probably where some of you might think I'm gonna say, Oh, Futurama should have stayed dead. New Futurama isn't anywhere as good as the old. 
And while that would certainly make my job noticeably easier, I'd be hard pressed to say it's as simple as all that. The second go of Futurama definitely isn't as great as its initial run, but it's also not as bad in the same way that later Simpsons seasons turned into. And not just because I'm trying to maintain this image of being fair and balanced TM. In my opinion, it would be better to describe Futurama's 6 and 7 seasons as wildly inconsistent, with episodes ranging anywhere between instant classics to forgettable flops, with most existing somewhere in the middle of Eh, it's decent, not as good as the older seasons, but not terrible. I know, glowing praise. Obviously, the original run of Futurama wasn't perfect either, and there was the occasional mediocre bits, but as a whole, it was consistently good. With the second run though, there's definitely some tired and lazy writing in a fair few episodes, often feeling like the idea for an episode only filled up about half the runtime, and the rest had to be crammed in with lame, hackneyed references and characters simply going through the motions. Frankly, the struggle of the overall quality in these later seasons highlights how Futurama is at its best when episodes have a heart to them, exploring characters' emotional states and personal relationships with each other while naturally layering in jokes. You know, that thing, uh, good writing. When characters have to start working for the plot, rather than the plot working for the characters, that's when you get your lamer episodes like the Da Vinci Code, a lame Da Vinci Code parody that felt dated even in 2010. And it's not like Futurama didn't do film parodies in older seasons. There's an entire season 1 episode dedicated to being an extended Titanic reference, something it regularly points out. But those parodies were often just a framing device to tell an actual story or had a greater meaning to them. And weren't just the writers going, Uh, remember that thing? Uh, it's a Susan Boyle. You get it? On top of just not being funny, an extended Britain's Got Talent reference from 2008 on Leela's butt, or a 20 minute homage to 80s cartoons, didn't progress any story worth telling and have ultimately zero substance beyond the reference they're making, which is something Futurama felt like it was above. But as these seasons took their time, they gradually began to find their legs again, and you started to see the Futurama that fans fell in love with peek through. The first big return to form being the sixth episode of Season 6, Lethal Inspection, a Bender and Hermes centered story about accepting one's mortality, with Bender realizing that his lack of a backup drive means he just has to accept the finite life he has, but not before seeking out vengeance on the inspector who forsaked him with this fleeting existence. Like we all wish we could. What pushed this episode over so much was that Hermes and Bender never got meaningful screen time together. So this episode being a standout for the series was largely due to how well they contrasted each other based on what we knew about them and how it developed their relationship. It showed a compassionate side to a character known for being inhuman and a vulnerable side to a character known for being indestructible. Though I wouldn't be doing my job as a pedantic YouTube critic if I didn't point out that Lethal Inspection's ending is still inconsistent with Bender's backstory and Bendless love. I mean, boy, I really hope someone got fire for that blunder. Of course, not every episode has to be a dramatic, emotional exploration of the meaning of life to be considered great either. The Prisoner of Benda, for example, presents a perfect case of a but therefore plot in comedic story writing, where the episode centers around all the characters progressively having their mind swapped between each other by a new invention the professor created. With the trade off, you can only swap one way, thus, hijinks ensue. That honestly could have been enough. However, with every mind switch being rooted in characters wanting something that requires a different body, they're then slammed with a roadblock of some kind, the butt, that therefore leads to further mind switching in order to solve it, which allows the plot to gradually expand outward in a natural way that keeps you invested in all the different threads going on, until they all eventually collide at the very end. Prisoner Venda is a straightforward setup with a subtle theme about appreciating the body you have, but when it comes to pure structure and pacing, it's one of Futurama's best episodes. And before all the comments berate me about it, yes, Ken Keeler, the writer of this episode, even went so far as to develop an entire real-life mathematical theorem to explain how many mind switches between characters would be required to get everyone involved back into their original bodies. And they say pure math has no real-world applications. Anyway, this is what makes these seasons so frustrating as a whole because they constantly oscillate between genuinely entertaining examinations of characters that rival some of the best of the series, and aggressively ham-fisted episodes about cell phone addiction and Obama birth certificate truthers, while well, they average out to being 
All right, these last two seasons definitely struggled to capture the magic of Futurama's original run on Fox. Without making massive assumptions about what was going on in the writer's room, it's really hard to say if this is due to much of the original writers not returning, with the stronger character-driven episodes being mostly handled by returning staff like Ken Keeler and Eric Horstead. Or maybe like The Simpsons, Futurama had just become part of the establishment it once rolled its eyes at. Or it's the same creative spark from almost a decade prior simply wasn't there anymore. Possibly the most aggravating aspect of Futurama's run on Comedy Central though, is how it spun its wheels with Leela and Fry's relationship, as it continued to be as vague as possible even after multiple confessions of love. Clearly the first four seasons of the show had this prominent will they won't they nature to their relationship. And the reason the first series finale resonated the way it did was because it was this beautiful admission of their feelings for each other, leaving us to hope that they got that happy ending together. But we're now past that, in a post large storyline Futurama, and the big conclusion of the fourth movie was the two finally professing their love for each other proper. Yet when we get to season 6, we continue to bounce between them going on dates, and then next they're platonic and Leela's rejecting Fry's advances outright. As much as I love the romantic episodes like the late Philip J. Fry, it progressively starts to feel like the writers either didn't want to write a hard status quo change into the story by firmly cementing their relationship, or didn't want to wrap up the last real character arc floating throughout the series. So it's best to keep putting out the same bait they've been using for years, despite that bait starting to grow mold. Even the second to last episode of season 6, Overclocked, addresses how little progress has been made with this relationship and how it feels like it has nowhere to go. Don't get me wrong, it's great that their relationship has evolved to the point that there's an episode dedicated to Leela trying to figure out if there's a future to be had with Fry, an extremely mature angle to view their relationship, but this is a moment where the show's addressing its own major writing problem. And this is exceptionally weird when this was planned as yet another series finale in the case there wasn't another production season. Overclocked is an episode which doesn't have either Fry or Leela actually come to an agreement about their future, with Leela abruptly leaving Fry and her job, and then unceremoniously returning at the very end so that they can have a happy conclusion to it. And it could have been the last episode. I know this is a bit of a fan favorite for some due to the ending where Bender gives them their future and they're able to see how it'll unfold together, but in my opinion, it doesn't hold up in hindsight when you actually take a step back and look at how it reflects on the two's relationship, especially when the next season has Fry and Leela right back to their extremely wishy-washy state. Bumpy long-term romances in series that have their ups and downs can be great, and are some of my favorite character moments. But after a while, it starts to get played out when it feels like it's not going anywhere. However, in continuing this theme of frustrating inconsistency, instead of allowing their relationship to meander endlessly and make my bitching that much simpler, the writers decided to conclude Futurama and Fry and Leela's relationship with one of the best episodes of the series. What started as unbridled hype for a sixth season, the anticipation for a return to form began to wane as the series marched on. Both returning fans and new audiences alike could see the cracks continuing to grow in what was once considered a watertight series. These cracks would eventually then give way when it was announced halfway through the airing of season 7 that Comedy Central would not be renewing the series further. And while no clear reasons have ever been given as far as my research has shown, the boring reality of it is that low ratings are likely the culprit. When Futurama started airing on Comedy Central, the show was getting over 2.5 million US viewers per episode, which was pretty good for a series on this network at the time. But by the latter half of season 7, it was barely scraping past a million. For a frame of reference, South Park was consistently doubling these numbers with its 16th and 17th seasons during those years while airing at a similar time slot and costing less to produce. Now of course, viewership isn't the definitive metric for a show's quality. We literally talked about how bad ratings can be caused by various other factors not 30 minutes ago. But it's hard not to notice the correlation between the last two seasons ratings with its overall critical response. It was getting advertised as much as any other show, it had a solid time slot. The simple fact of the matter is, people just weren't tuning in to watch it anymore. While it's definitely easy to blame Fox for a lot of the first run's failings, Comedy Central did everything in its power to give Futurama the best chance it could on their network. So sadly, there isn't anyone to really look at for how it did in its second run, outside of its own creative staff. Since the writers had gone quite familiar with the sort of Damocles called cancellation over their head though, 
they did have something brewing for the finale of season 7 in the event it would be yet another last. So the episode, meanwhile, would be the final swan song of Futurama. And it couldn't have been a more perfect way to end it. Starting off with the delivery to the moon, a clear callback to the second ever episode, Meanwhile has Fry worried about a potential future without Leela, and so he decides he's going to propose to her. But after a mix-up with a button that rewinds everything 10 seconds and a watch with the wrong time, Fry ends up leaping to his death, believing he'd been rejected. An important reminder to turn your clocks back during daylight savings. However, after a dozen or so splatter carcasses across the pavement, the button ends up getting shattered, leaving Fry and Leela stuck inside the frozen time as the only ones able to move. If this was another show at another time, this would be the perfect setup for some wacky hijinks. But instead, the couple choose to take the opportunity to live out their happiest moment together, with no concerns or worries in this single snapshot of existence. Spending their honeymoon exploring the world, the duo simply enjoy each other's company as they grow old together. There's admittedly not a ton of laugh out loud bits throughout this episode, being more about the sincere emotion of it all, though it does have one of my personal favorite jokes in the series. I tried to fix it once, but then I got mad and hit it some more. I guess it's good we didn't have children. But as much as we wish we could, you can't live in that one moment forever. You have to move on at some point. So the final twist of the episode comes when the professor arrives through a time tunnel to fix the button, presenting the old newlyweds with the chance to return back to before time had been frozen, but with the caveat that they would forget everything that happened since. Obviously there isn't really an option here since they can't reasonably leave everything in stasis, but there's a poetic beauty to the pair acknowledging the joy they had together and agreeing to do it all over again, even if it meant they would forget all the time they shared upon restarting, because they want to take the chance to re-experience it all over again, leaving us to question if it'll all play out exactly the same way or not. Then, won't that simply lead us to the same conclusion as before? I cannot deny the possibility. Shit, sorry, wrong clip. If you want to take it a step further and reframe it a bit, knowing that Meanwhile is the ending to the series, with the characters resetting the clock to some ambiguous time before the episode started, it actually creates a perfect cycle back around to the first episode, and Futurama becomes a story of Fry and Leela eternally going through their lives to fall in love again. If that implication wasn't already there, the original airing of Meanwhile was immediately followed by the pilot. This isn't an uncommon thing with series finales, since following up the last episode with its first is a nice reflection for how far a series has come, but I prefer to think of it as intentional on some level. As much as the final season had its ups and downs, I honestly don't think there could have been a better conclusion to send off the series, giving us a brilliant final moment with a couple that had been set up all the way back in 1999. But with that moment coming to an end, Futurama had to go with it. I hope that despite all my whinging, it's clear that I really do love this series, and the latter half of this video isn't an attempt to shit on the writers or anyone that enjoyed Futurama after the original run, but mostly venting frustrations about the issues that started coming up by the end. Regardless of all my gripes, Futurama was and still is an exceptional series. Seven years since the conclusion, even with the success of series like Rick and Morty and Final Space, Fans and creators are still attempting to fill the void that Futurama left. And while we've gone close, nothing has done it so far. And I don't think anything ever will. To this day, Matt Groening and David X. Cohen are still asked at cons or during interviews if there's a chance Futurama might be brought back again in some shape or form in the future, with Groening continuing to say that he's always open for it to return whenever they're given the chance to. And I can see why he'd want to. In listening to things like the DVD commentary, you can tell there's a lot of ideas that the writers never got the chance to execute like they wanted to for one reason or another. When you're always planning for the next season to potentially be your last, it's difficult to actually pace out a series and do everything you'd like to. But by that same token, I think it's best that Futurama stays buried. In contrast to Graining, Cohen has recognized that the amount of times they've had to write a final episode is a bad sign for the show which is why he's happy he was able to make as many episodes as he did. Looking back, even the four seasons of the original run is still plenty more than most other series are ever lucky enough to get. I can understand wanting to get another creative swing at something you think didn't get a fair shot, but with the amount of chances Futurama did get, at a certain point you just gotta accept that it wasn't meant to be. 
Frankly, I think this is better than the alternative, because in television, there's definitely worse fates than death. So rather than lamenting what could have been, like what if Fox Studios weren't incompetent, or what if the show was able to get more of its old writers back for the later seasons, I think it's better to learn from Futurama itself, in that it's healthier to accept what happened in the past, and using that to look towards the future.